and I'll also let people know like during it that they can put their questions in to not like Great. if they have a question just write it as soon as and you can also say that too if you want. Great. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Yona, are we waiting for anybody else? Uh, waiting room's open, so people can just come in as soon as they need. Great, so we'll just get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the David M. Hunt Libraries program, Home Scale Composting with Shamu Sadeh. Mm -hmm. I'm Meg Sher, the Assistant Director of the Library. I'm especially pleased to introduce Shamu today because I've been fortunate to learn with and work for Shamu in different capacities since I first came to Falls Village 15 years ago. Shamu Sada is an environmental studies instructor, Jewish educator, writer, organic farmer, and wilderness guide. He has taught environmental studies, ecology, and Judaic studies at Portland State University, Berkshire Community College, Southern Vermont College, and the Wild Rockies Field Institute. He founded the Adama Fellowship at the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center in 2004, a residential fellowship for young adults that integrates organic agriculture, farm to table living, Jewish learning, community building, social justice, and spiritual practice. Shamu currently serves as the managing edit, edit, excuse me, managing director of education at Isabella Friedman. Adama runs a six month CSA where participants receive weekly or biweekly shares of in season organic produce. This year, shares can be picked up in Falls Village at the library or in Sharon. I can put, I'm gonna put the CSA registration link in the chat if you're interested. The Hunt Library is excited to be partnering with Shamu and Adama in this program to offer information on composting and environmentally, environmentally friendly practices to our patrons. Your support helps us to continue to offer programming on a wide range of topics, all free of charge. If you wish to do so, I will also place the link to our donation page in the chat. And now I'll hand it over to Shamu. Thanks, Shamu. Thanks, Megan. That's so exciting. This is so fun to do with Megan. And just so great to do something with the best little library in the world, the M. Hunt Library, which has an amazing selection, by the way, of gardening books and organic gardening books and composting. I can, for a small library, really outrageous, yeah, resources. So, um, well, welcome. It's great to have everyone. And just switch my view so I can see folks. Feel free to be on or off video as you need to be. And if we if we get to see your face, that would be that would be fun because I'll get to know who's here. I'm gonna give a short little intro. We're gonna watch an eight minute video about how we compost here on the farm. And then basically we're going to take questions. The goal is for you all to either start a compost if you don't already have a compost or if you have a compost, have it work better for you. That's that's the whole goal. So if we spend half the time answering questions about your compost pile, great. Um, this is, it's not about theory. This is about making something happen in your backyards. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that at the end of this class, we really want people to feel empowered not because they're the perfect composters and they know the science precisely and they know everything exactly, but because they feel like they have enough information to start playing in the world of composting. Just as you probably cook dinner tonight, even though you're maybe not like a five-star chef, like so too, you can have a compost in your backyard, even though you might not understand all the specifics of carbon to nitrogen ratio and the oxygen consumption of tiny organisms, you don't need to. There's some basics that you can understand and then you can compost. And yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I'm gonna ask uh, Yona to start the video and after that we'll get together for some questions composting totally revolutionary such an easy way to make major major positive impact right if you compost at home you're both like helping to keep carbon in the soil keep our climate stable you're working against 
trying to reverse all the environmental racism of dragging all our garbage through poor people's neighborhoods and people of color's neighborhoods to deposit it in a landfill where it causes all kinds of problems. You're part of nutrient cycles, even if you don't have space to grow anything. Composting is so massively, massively important. So I want to start with like the kitchen end of things, the things we're collecting and composting, then we'll go down to the piles. So some of the things that are obviously compostable, found a very large zucchini, found leftovers of someone's bagel and locks on it, so sad, locks too. But yes, you can compost all dairy products, you can compost meat. Yes, this bone came from the compost pile. Will it decompose as quickly as other things? No. But will it decompose and put nutrients into the soil? Yes, for sure. So everything except for plastic and glass and metal, you can compost. I'll repeat again. You can compost cheese and dairy and fatty stuff and meat. No problem doing it. The only reason some municipalities discourage it is they're worried about raccoon, encouraging raccoons or rats. Honestly, raccoons and rats live really well off the garbage that's sitting at the curb. So composting is not, not responsible for all that. These kinds of containers from ice cream, totally compostable. I work at a retreat center, so we use some, some one-time use compostables. This, um, the greenware, this is actually made of plants. This is plastic, but not petroleum plastic. It's made of corn and potato starch. This is compostable as well. And obviously vegetable peelings and all this stuff, all this can go in our composting bucket. And um, coffee grounds, also really great, really valuable stuff. And coffee filters, all this, all this can be composted. So we're going to leave the one soil classroom, one soil, because it's all one soil, the banana peel, the coffee grounds, the bones, my own bones once I die. It's all one soil. Let's go to the compost piles. So your compost pile at home might not be this big, but all the principles are the same, right? You've got your browns and your greens or your carbonaceous stuff and your nitrogenous stuff. And we'll talk about temperature and moisture and time. And those are, that's how you get the recipe for a compost pile. So all these things that I just showed you can go in the pile, right? We've got coffee grounds and some citrus peels, right? We have um, the zucchini and the bones and all the stuff we just talked about. I'm going to just take some leaves because we have a lot of leaves on the pile. Leaves here, I'm going to throw the leaves over it, right? It's super important to have some brown, some like old grass clippings or hay or leaves to cover the food waste. You've got to balance it out. You can't make a compost pile out of just food waste. It's got to be balanced out with your browns or your carbonaceous material. Here we mostly use leaves. And after this has been sitting for a while, and I'll turn it with the tractor, we don't water the compost pile unless we have a serious drought for several weeks. People in desert regions might want to cover their compost pile so they lose less moisture to evaporation. But basically, a compost pile is supposed to be like a, like a wrung out sponge. You should never see liquid leaching out of your compost pile. Then it's too wet and you need more dry material, more dry leaves or wood shavings or shredded paper or cardboard, whatever. But come and check out this uh, thermometer. You can see it's about 108 degrees in there. And I just pulled it out of our other pile, which has been sitting there for a little while, and it was over 135. So these piles will get hot. They're big enough to get hot. Do you need to worry if your backyard compost pile it was small and will never get hot? No, it's not an issue. It just maybe will sit there for longer. Reaching the high temperatures above 131, 140 means that we kill weed seeds and kill any of the pathogenic bacteria. If, God forbid, goats die or sheep die or other animals die, they also go in this compost pile, right? And according to Jew Jewish burial custom, we all essence, when we're buried, in essence, that's like a compost pile as well. So 
you shouldn't be able to see food waste on top, right? We're always going to cover the food waste with wood shavings or something else. So this is our fresh pile. We'll add to this until it gets a little bit larger. Then we'll stop adding to it and we'll start another pile. In the meantime, come and see the finished pile here. This pile is almost complete, cycle almost complete. It's been here a while, it's been cooking for a while. It's reached temperatures over above 140 degrees for weeks. It smells like the forest floor. It smells like broken down leaf matter. You should not be able to smell food waste at all in finished compost. It should be a very mild, earthy smell. And that's what we have here. And you shouldn't really be able to see anything recognizable in here besides little bits of sand, little sticks, rocks, some leaves pieces of leaves and leaf stem and this stuff will biodegrade further. We'll always have a little bit of sticks and some pebbles but this will be ready to spread in um, really in a few weeks. This is our leaf pile. You need a pile of leaves or buy, buy a few bales of hay. You need a carbon pile and you generally need five times the volume of carbon to food waste. You need a lot of leaves or old grass clippings or hay to properly compost and balance out food waste. This is our pile. And here's our last pile, right? That pile is about three weeks old. Before that, this was the main pile. It also got, it got a lot of chicken poop. It got a lot of goat poop and then food waste and leaves. That's all that's in this pile. It is transformation in progress. Thank God this to all the microbes who are doing all the work. It's really the FBI, the fungi, bacteria, and vertebrates who are doing the work here. And you can see that we're climbing up over 130 degrees in here. And this has been cooking already for weeks. And we'll, this will go a few months before it's really finished compost. FBI, the fungi, bacteria, and vertebrates, they're doing the work. We're just creating the right conditions for microbes. And those conditions are aeration. Lots of leaves or fluffy stuff. Grass clippings help to create air spaces. So that's aeration. We, and that also has to do with wet and dry. Not letting your pile get too wet by having a lot of dry stuff in it. Make sure there's lots of oxygen. We give them a balanced diet. That's your browns and greens, your carb Benaceous stuff like your leaves and your nitrogenous stuff like your food waste. They need that balance like carbs and protein. Um, and moisture, some right amount of moisture. And then they need a bunch of time and they're the ones doing all that work, getting that pile up to 131 degrees and breaking everything down. If you want to make their job easier, the smaller the pieces are that you put in your compost pile, the faster they will degrade because you're creating more surface area, more access for the fungi and the bacteria to devour your food waste. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks for your patience. Um, happy to take questions. Also, thanks to Yona, the cinematographer editor and chief director and producer of that compost video. We are in Falls Village, so I am excited to welcome you all one day to the actual farm and where we can do this face to face. Uh, but for now, I saw a, cu a couple questions on the chat and maybe we'll deal with the pest question first in terms of attracting animals. Will your compost pile attract animals? Yes. When people leave their garbage outside, that also attracts animals. Um, it all depends on, you know, your layout, how close to your house it is, how close your neighbors. Do you want to, you can purchase a bin, you know, you can buy a compost bin made out of hopefully recycled plastic. You can buy one of these, you can, there's lots of different versions. That's one way. Um, if you want that look, you can also build a, you can go to the Falls Village transfer station and get four pallets, packing wooden pallets and put those together with some wire or a few screws. And that can be your compost. And there's so many ways to do it. Or you can just have a pile 
right? There are lots and lots of different ways to do this. So I don't want to assume what's right for your backyard. So uh, yeah, we'll just start there. So some of the pest access depends on how you do it. If you really want it, if you're really concerned about, you know, having a skunk walk through your backyard, then maybe you want it in a bin or, or in a pallet with make, that you make a top with a window screen or whatever. So there's ways of keeping the pests out. Um, but I do want to encourage people, we live in a rural area, um, we have plenty of space, but we should be composting everything, meaning dairy, meat, bones. Like I understand maybe in tighter places where there's less land and more people that you need to put some limitations on what people put in their compost pile. But if we don't put it in our compost pile, I mean, let's be real about this. It's gonna get dragged from here to Hartford in a diesel truck. Food waste is heavy stuff. You know that, right? The kitchen waste we produce is heavy stuff. That's a lot of diesel particulates. It's a lot of diesel fuel, right? It's a poor, mostly African-American neighborhood where the um, incinerator is. And it doesn't incinerate well. This stuff doesn't burn well. <laughs> it's not, it, the whole thing doesn't, doesn't work and it's not a good thing. So anything, any piece of organic matter that we can keep out of our waste stream has major impact in terms of the climate, in terms of environmental justice, it's just a good thing. So that's why I don't, yeah, I'm just not that wor worried about uh, bears or raccoons. And if you are, put it in a closed space. So you've got your bin or you can make a three bin situation if, if that works for you. If you have more volume of food waste depends on the number of people you're, you're, um, you're cooking for, composting for. And it's really important to have a big pile of leaves there or a big pile of hay. You need some big source of browns or carbonaceous matter. If you just take your food waste and throw it in a pile in your backyard, it will stink really bad. It'll go anaerobic. It won't compost and it'll just stink. And I think that's some of the reasons people, some people are scared of composting is they think composting, it stinks, it's gross. It's really not if you do it right. All that mean, all that, the most important thing is just making sure you have enough dry matter. You have a pile of leaves, cover it with a tarp. Um, you, you know, um, oh, I just forgot the name of the uh, Ingersoll, the cabinet maker, you know, you can get perfect pure sawdust for them. They put out back in Cornwall in back of their factory. You can use sawdust. You can use, there's, there's a bunch of stuff you can use for carbon. If you don't have those things, you can buy a couple bales of hay and just leave them there. Maybe consider covering them so they last a little bit longer. So that every time you make a deposit of food waste, you're covering it with five to seven times the volume of carbon, of browns. That gives you your oxygen. It makes, you, makes sure that you're, compost won't be too wet and won't go anaerobic. Anaerobic means oxygen poor. And that's where you get the bad smells. And that's where you get methane production. And methane is 27 times more powerful than CO2 as a global climate change gas. We don't, we don't want it. We don't want to produce methane. So do you have to, people are asking, do you have to mix, uh, mix or flip your pile? This really depends on how much food waste you're producing. There's people who never mix their pile. They never turn it over because they're really careful about having very thick layers of dry stuff of browns in there. And they do, you know, it's kind of a lasagna thing. Um, I am so used to composting a lot of food waste because we compost, you know, when the retreat center is open, a couple hundred pounds a day of very sloppy, wet stuff. So I can't even imagine not, I have to turn the pile because otherwise it gets anaerobic. It, it, it goes oxygen poor because it's just it's too wet. It's too, it's so much food waste. I think it's good to, to, to turn your pile. 
Um, if your pile smells, again, there's two things you can do if your pile smells. And if you remember nothing else from this class, remember these two things. If your pile smells, turn it over, add carbon. Turn it over, add carbon. <laughs> That's it. That'll fix most composting problems. When people say they're having a problem with their compost pile, it's like, well, why don't you try turning it over and adding some carbon? That will handle most things, um, honestly. Um, but if you don't, but you don't need to turn your pile. And some of this also depends on, are you in a hurry? Are you trying to process a lot of food waste quickly so you can have it available for your garden? If you want to do it quickly, you want smaller pieces in your pile. That means chopping up your food waste or whatever. If it means running your leaves through, uh, I don't know what people run their leaves through to make them smaller, but a, a mulcher or whatever, a mulching mower, um, that'll make it happen faster. And turning your compost pile will make it compost faster. But if you're not in a huge hurry, you don't need to turn your pile. You don't need to turn it often. And if you just walked out because you just had guests over, you know, family over for Thanksgiving and it's not COVID anymore and you had a big party and you had lots of food waste, then um, that next two weeks, I would turn your pile after that. If you just dump like a, you know, two five gallon buckets of really wet sloppy stuff on your pile, soon after that is a good time to turn it, um, to mix it up. Um, cereal boxes for sure. Junk mail, I wouldn't do. Um, junk mail is it's valuable as to recycle paper. Papers, office papers is, is valuable to recycle. Greasy pizza boxes, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Really, this is for you all. This is for your backyard compost pile. So just jump in and ask whatever you need to know. Eggshells for sure, so good in your compost. They will last, sorry, I'm embarrassing to do, but I'm pulling a tick off me, which I felt on my uh, <laughs> head for a while. I was outside working a lot on the farm today and there's a tick. Okay, that'll be the next class, tick removal, Megan, right? <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me there. Um, Eggshells are totally fine. They do last a while in the compost pile. They don't disappear right away. That's totally fine. And if you end up spreading them back on your garden, not decomposed, that's also okay. It's just a bunch of, just a bunch of calcium and maybe it'll help you with the slugs. Coffee grounds from local cafe, so great. Is it possible to have too much coffee grounds? That's a great question. I haven't had that problem. I'm not sure. Um, I generally compost piles are safer if you have a good mix of things so if your compost pile was like 70 percent coffee grounds honestly i'd have to you'd have to do some research to know what that means i it, it, i don't know if it's low ph if it's quite acidic coffee grounds um but i think i just make sure you have lots of leaves <laughs> or lots of hay or lots of something um yeah but that's great coffee grounds are wonderful Absolutely wonderful. When is it ready for your garden? Great question. You can tell your nose knows. How does it smell? Does it smell like when, and I bring hundreds of people every year and, and when I bring people on a farm tour, I actually make them pick up a pile, not of the current food waste pile, but of the finished pile that I showed in the video. And I say, you know, what does it smell like? And it, people always say the forest floor. Like it smells like the forest. It smells very mild. Um, that's when your compost is ready. If you detect any smell that smells anything like food scraps, too early. Anything vaguely alcoholic, which is just another fermentation process, no good. Um, so you just have to wait. And you shouldn't be able to see anything except little pieces of leaves or sticks and maybe you know, your avocado pit, I don't know, those things take forever. Um, but you should be able to tell from the way it looks, it should really look pretty, pretty broken down, pretty fine, pretty generic and brown. You shouldn't be able to recognize like, oh, there's that, you know, toast from the other day. Oh, chickens in the compost yard. Um, oh, weeds. 
I think it's, so weeds are a great question. So the big question here, weeds in general, yes, for sure. The question is weeds that are going to seed, that are in seed, weeds that are actively trying to spread their seeds. Do you wanna have them in your compost pile? If you put weed seeds, weeds that are seeding in your compost pile, you need to give, you need to either, it needs to get to a high temperature or you need to let it sit for like a year. Not a year, okay, six months. You need to let it sit longer. Otherwise you'll end up spreading seeds into your garden, weed seeds into your garden. Um, the advantage of the higher temperatures are that they kill weed seeds, but it's very hard to get high temperatures if your pile's really small. You need a good sized pile to get the higher temperatures. Um, you can have another pile that's just for weed seeds that you just leave stuff there for a very long time. That's okay. People ask often about pet poop, right? Totally fine. It's something that I would leave for a very long time. I wouldn't mix it into the garden. I would spread it around fruit trees or spread it in the forest when I was done. I would not mix pet poop compost into the garden. Might be too much information for some people. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to come to talk about dog poop, but it's, it's a great question. And it's a lot better than putting it in the garbage. Have a, have a distinct pile for it and let it sit. Uh, we do have chickens in our compost yard. They weren't in that video because of the time we had moved them onto a different piece of pasture. They're really fun because they pick through the pile. They help aerate and they help break everything down into smaller pieces. And if you've got a lot of food waste, they eat a lot of food waste. And that's basically their food. And then you don't have to buy them feed, which is a great thing. Yeah, compost pile when it's freezing. Yeah, I just keep adding stuff. It's true. I mean, our piles are big enough so they don't freeze all the way through. But um, otherwise, yes. And when I have had smaller piles, you just end up with a pile of kind of frozen stuff for a while. I always try to keep something, some leaves or, um, or bags full of wood shavings, something I can get to that's not gonna to be totally frozen solid so I can add it to the compost in the winter. That's the biggest thing um, because it gets hard when you have like you know, two feet of snow and a frozen pile of leaves and all that. And then it just starts up again in the spring. Oh, uh, not a problem with smaller piles. It's getting hot. You have a lot of dry leaves. Is there a chance of spontaneous combustion in this climate? No. The only place I've heard of that is commercial composting operations that have blowers in their piles, like either fans blowing air or vacuums pulling air through. They get up to like 180 degrees. You or I, our compost pile, will never get that hot without major mechanical intervention. <laughs> um, so yeah, no problem, no problem with fire. The biggest problem with fire is honestly, people like me who put their wood ashes from their you know, wood burning stove in the pile before waiting for them to go out. That's the only way I've started a fire in my compost pile. Um, did I catch all the questions? Once, um, once it's finished, yeah, great question. How do you integrate compost into your garden? Compost really should be integrated. It shouldn't be left on top. Your compost is your most valuable organic matter that you're adding to your soil. Anything that you leave on top of the soil is going to suffer from too much light, drying out, wind, right? Soil organisms like to be in the cool dark. So it's another reason to mulch in your garden. So you could sprinkle your compost on top and then cover with mulch, right? By mulch, I mean, in this case, usually hay mulch or straw mulch or whatever else you're using in your garden. So you're not having bare soil because bare soil is a problem because the soil is getting dried out by the sun and the wind and, and also eroded by the wind and the rain. Um, and since compost is so valuable, if you're not mulching, you want to, at least rake it in so it's not all on the surface. 
any is anything off limits good question um i don't know certain pop music i think is off limits right yona is there just some pop music we shouldn't listen to i'm asking the teenagers they know the answers to what's off limits right um teasing okay um pet poop and i talked about that um no no problem with potatoes no i really don't think any other meat or vegetable things are a problem remember if you put bones in there they're gonna you're gonna they're gonna have to go through the cycle a few times they're not going to be ready in three to six months it'll take years but i mean look people go to garden centers all the time and buy bone um you know buying bone dust fertilizer right? It's just another version of fertilizer. It's just going to take a long time. But no, there's nothing really that you can't compost. Ashes from a charcoal grill. I don't see why not, right? It's just mesquite briquettes or whatever, right? There's nothing else in there that I know of. I don't know that much about charcoal, but it should be fine. Should be totally fine. Uh, urine, human urine, pee is also great in a compost pile, totally fine and really uh, useful for the compost because it's tons of nitrogen. Also might not be what you wanted to hear tonight, but it's true. Yes. Ashes qualify as brown. Oh, that's a good question. They're kind of in their own category in a way. I guess they do got classify as browns, but, I, but your most important browns are bulky fluffy you know because they help with the aeration so in that sense not not so much as not so much like brown ashes yeah yeah um and i'm really um happy you should feel free like i'm happy to be a compost resource for you if you feel like there's still questions after this class that you want to ask I'm here in Falls Village, friend of DM Hunt Library, and I'm happy to answer questions and happy to have people on the farm eventually um, as well. Oh, we also, I should just say something, we do have two planting dates if you want to join us this spring, April 18th and the 25th, Sundays of Earth Month, this Earth Month. Uh, the 18th, we'll be planting wetland shrubs, restoring the, the Hollenbeck. Um, the field we have in the Hollenbeck River where Megan farmed 15 years ago. And, and then on the 25th, we'll be planting chestnut trees up on BB Hill Road. We're planting a chestnut orchard. So um, we'll put the link to those events some point in the chat. And um, yeah, but any other, any, any other composting questions? I haven't talked, there's other versions often when I'm teaching this, I'm teaching it to city folk. There's all kinds of other resources available for city folk. I'm assuming that most of you all live in this area. So you've got physical space. You've got space to have a compost yard. Um, should you add worms? You don't need to add worms. You don't need to add anything. Will it help your compost pile if you if you start off, you started off with a little bit of the last compost, for sure, that's a bit of inoculation. But one of the amazing things about composting is that these organisms are just present. They are around, they just show up to do the work, right? You don't have to like make sure you've got the right fungi and there, make sure you've got the right bacteria. They are provided. That's why we call it ecosystem services, right? That's some of the functioning of the earth that we tend to take for granted. Does anyone want to, um, does anyone want, if my compost pile from last year looks ready? Yeah, I would, if it looks ready from last year, totally. I would, you know, put it to the side and start a new pile. Totally. Yeah, I would start all over again. So, oh, yeah, just to say spring is the best time to incorporate compost in your garden. The next six weeks are the best time. <laughs> Close to when you're planting. I mean, you know, I wouldn't incorporate compost now and then plant in May, you know, close to planting time. But the spring is the best time because the plants have the greatest nutritional needs starting out. Um, so when people ask about our big compost piles, 
some of it sits for a year, not because it needs to sit for a year, but because we really spread in April and May. And so if the compost is finished in October, we're not gonna spread it except for garlic, except for planting garlic. Um, so yeah, now's the time to start a new compost pile, either by pulling your finished compost off, throwing it on a tarp or making yourself another bin or whatever else. And if anyone wants to share about specifically how they're composting or what their bin or any, what their system looks like, um, yeah, feel free right now to, to tell us. How are you composting? Open, did you buy a bin? What's working for you? Thanks, Helena. So you, you've got an open pile and that works for you. Susan just bought bins that rotate. Wonderful. Sounds like, sorry, also open pile. Yeah, maybe it's time to start a new one for sure. And yeah, if they fill up fast, um, are you, that does it mean you just get another bin or you empty the half done stuff out of a bin and let it sit outside to compost in the different stages or you bought another bin, great. Great. And I'll just say for folks, you know, whose bins are filling up, it doesn't need to be in the bin the whole time. It can be a bit in a bin through the most intensive part of the process. But once it's halfway there or three quarters of the way there, you can take it out and have it in a pile. And at that point, it's not going to be so attractive to pests because it'll be half finished. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you can keep it on a tarp. You can have it in a pile until you're ready to, um, to spread it in your yard. But that's great to know. It sounds like people are doing a variety of things. Super, super important. If your neighbors and friends don't compost, let them bring your food waste to you to compost. And if you, after this session, don't feel like you're ready to compost, talk to me and you can bring your compost to our pile. Totally happy to take it. Um, the leaves we raked in the fall from the air next to the pile. That's great. That is the best thing to do. Yep. Save those leaves for, for your compost. Then you can take a handful or two every time you're, you, um, you throw on food waste. Oh, my email. Totally. Good idea. Let's think. It'll just take me half an hour to write this chat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there you go. Um, that's my email. Totally happy to uh, answer emails about compost. Happy to answer emails if people want to know about the CSA or the planting days or want to see our compost pile. Oh, break leaves at the base of trees. You mean fruit trees or wild trees? I mean, and it, oaks and stuff. I think it really depends if it's like a forest environment that you're going for, that's, that's what's around you or that's what you're managing, totally fine, right? That's what happens to leaves in nature. If you're trying to grow, you know, if it's an orchard and you're growing fruit trees, it's not that, um, the only time I think I'd probably do that would be in the fall. Um, I generally mulch fruit trees with something heavier like wood chips, but it, it's fine to use leaves as well. Um, the hard thing about leaves in a more orchard or garden setting is they tend to get really wet and mat down. And that tends to bring down the soil temperature, especially in the spring when you want the soil temperatures to run, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. If you have lots of leaves under your, you know, in your orchard, then at least you just got to rake them up so they're not uh, matted in that way. The problem with matting, M-A-T-T, -T, is, um, is that it goes anaerobic, it's just wet. And you want aerobic, you want oxygen rich. That's why wood chips are so great. And you can get them for free at the tramp, that mountain, outside the transfer station, fill up some buckets, fill up the back of your pickup truck, 
super, super useful if you're doing, and I'm not here, I'm talking about growing perennial plants, I'm not talking about for like vegetable beds, but for your fruit trees, for your blueberries, for your raspberries, for, you know, flower beds, mulch is great. Yeah, thanks for putting that stuff up there, Yona, for sure. Leaf mold. Um, leaf mold is just partially decomposed leaves. Totally good, good stuff, good stuff to use. I'd, I'd want to get it composted. It, it's fine to use. It's partially decomposed with perennials, orchards. For veggies, I want it composted all the way, generally. I'm curious to hear because there's a uh, small village, False Village is such a small place and there's only a few names that I recognize. Would people just put in the chat where they're, where they're zooming in from? All the way from Cornwall <laughs> and Sharon, great. Guilford, a little further. Pittsfield, same watershed, Bark Hampstead. Great, great, a lot of locals. Stratford down the, down the river, nice. Great, well, I feel very lucky to, to be living in this beautiful place and have, to have land to grow fruit and to compost. And us composters know that farming or Gardening is a byproduct of composting. People think it's the other way around, but because we compost, we might as well grow some food, right? Anything else I can answer for folks? End of season tomato plants. Um, tomatoes are so interesting, so many. So it depends, so much depends on what scale you're doing this at, you know, if you want your big tomato vines to compost quickly, you'd chop them up, right? We don't do that on the farm because we're, you know, it's just a massive, massive amount of stuff. So, um, and our compost piles get hot. So I'm not really worried about, about, you know, diseases. And I haven't heard of that being a problem most of the tomato diseases around moisture and soil splash back. So yeah, it should be totally fine. End of season tomato plants to compost them. Blueberries, acidic soil for sure. Um, they do like compost. I would spread some in the spring, but nothing, nothing will work well with your blueberries until you get the pH down to 4.5. And that's a long way to go <laughs> around here. We're in limestone region, so our soils are high, like 6.5 or 7. Um, elemental sulfur, pelletized sulfur. There's nothing in it but clay and sulfur. It's called elemental sulfur. You, up here, you can get it at um, any garden store or, oh my God, the place in Amenia that used to be called CPS and now has a different name. I can't think of what it is, um, but I, I would just buy the elemental sulfur. Ah, it's not tractor supply. It's, um, oh, it's nutrient, nutrient ag and amenia. They sell it. Well, it's, you know, that's, I guess, not useful to, for everyone. It's useful for my scale because we have 150 bushes. They sell it in 50 pound, 50 pound bags. In smaller amounts, yes, you can get a tractor spot, you can get an agway, elemental sulfur, um, get a pH test, either the home pH test or send it into Connecticut. Um, what's it called? Extension. I think it's $15. It might be $20. Follow the directions, go to their website. They have directions on how to take, take a soil sample, send it in, and then you need to do the calculations, how to get, you know, they'll tell you what your pH is and you need to do your calculations to drop it. It'll take years. I mean, it doesn't happen in one season. It'll take nine months at least for the sulfur you add to be incorporated in the soil and start dropping the pH. So it's a process. 
also mulch with pine needles. Mulch with pine needles. Um, yeah. And they do like compost. For sure. Everyone likes compost. Let's just admit it. Everyone loves compost. Our compost bins here used to have a big, uh, you know, painting on them that said compost saves. Like that. What's that? You did that? Megan that was Payne. my first building project. Oh my God, you made Yeah, that. for so sure. Great. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that Adama is going to be doing another program with us on the 25th of April at two o'clock. They're going to be teaching uh, Carly, Shamu's colleague, is going to be teaching a lacto-fermentation workshop. So I'm going to put the link in the chat to sign up if you're interested. The page has all the stuff that you need to do small-scale uh, home lacto-fermentation. And for, for um, people who are not as expert in it as Megan is, Lacto right. fermentation is also known as pickling. Yes. <laughs> Traditional pickling. You can make your own, vinegar, yeah, salt, salt, water pickles. salt yeah. pickles. And that can be, that includes sauerkraut, it includes kimchi, and includes cucumber pickles, and lots of other things. Very much like composting. Composting, we're creating the right conditions for the microorganisms to take over, for the FBI to take over, right? Fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. Lacto, traditional pickling, we're creating the right conditions, different conditions for the, the bacteria to sour the vegetables. So it's very similar in a lot of ways. Um, neem oil, well, aphids. I don't, I have to say that we, I don't do a lot of pest control. Jana's really the expert at that. Um, the one thing we do, and we don't spray things on the farm in general, not even organic stuff. The one thing we do use is called surround. It's kaolin clay, it's just clay dust. Surround is the, um, the brand name. And we mix it with water and spray it on the plants. It doesn't kill anything, but it annoys crawling insects. Otherwise, um, smaller scale gardeners, you know, just go around and smush stuff with your fingers. But I'm sure other, there's other people who have better garden pest control advice than I do. I have a favorite thermometer. Um, I like, it's so easy to bend them in these very large piles. So I can't remember what it's called, but I like the one that has the orange case around the dial. And I, I don't know what it's called, but it's a large scale 36 inch composting thermometer that, that where the, the dial is protected by this little frame. And do you need to know the comp? I mean, you don't need, I think it's fun, but you don't need a thermometer to compost. Does anybody have any other questions before we wrap up for the evening? Okay. Way to so put composters. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Um, so I put the link to the YouTube channel. The library has a YouTube channel. We recorded this session. We'll put it up in a couple of days so you can look back at it if you want to, um, if that's helpful to you. And you can see the other stuff that we've done over the last couple of months as well. Um, and thanks to Shamu for sharing your compost knowledge with us. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening.